Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining our program today, Securing a Livable Planet, Recent Developments from the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. My name is Elizabeth Niles. I am a member of the ABA International Law Section's International Animal Law Committee. I am pleased to introduce our distinguished speakers today. Tanya Sanarib is the International Legal, Legal Director for the Center for Biological Diversity. Tanya works in the Center's inter International Program to Protect Imperiled Species and Biological Diversity Worldwide. Before joining the Center, she was a staff attorney with the Craig Law Center in Portland, Oregon, and a partner at the public interest law firm of Meyer, Glitzenstein, and Eubanks in Washington, D.C. She earned her law degree and certificate in environmental and natural resources law in 2002 from Lewis and Clark Law School and received a bachelor's in environmental science from Colorado College. Zach Smith is a senior attorney and director for global Bio biodiversity conservation nature program at the NRDC. Zach leads the NRDC's global strategy to tackle the two primary drivers of nature's decline ecosystem destruction, and direct exploitation of spe species. He focuses on engaging with international agreements that are coordinating a global response to the bio biodiversity crisis. His work preserving wild animals and wild spaces involves environmental and sustainability issues, including building climate change resil resilience, supporting ecosystem conservation, and limiting harmful trade in wild plants and animals. Zach holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's from Johns Hopkins University, and a law degree from the University of California, Los Angeles. He is based in Bozeman, Montana. Please submit any questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to submit them throughout the program, and we will try to address as many as we can, time permitting, at the end of the program. With that, I will turn it over to Zach Smith. Thank you. Oh, Zach, I think you're muted. All right, thank you very much. I am going to start. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Okay, great. So yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm here today to talk about how we're gonna secure a livable planet, in particular focusing on two international approaches or two at an international level, focusing on two recent um, meetings that took place um, in November and December of 2022 at the end of the year, um, which are two global treaties that have the potential to help us um, help us secure a livable planet. Uh, again, my name is Zach Smith and I am the Director of Global Wildlife Conservation. Um, here's, I'm just gonna share a little bit of the outline for today. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna provide some information that kind of places this at the beginning of an understanding of what's happening um, in the natural world. So we're gonna talk about how nature is in decline. Um, and then I'm going to move on to the recent developments of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, then to hand it over to Tanya, who's going to speak about the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, and then wrap up with some pandemic prevention before we have some time for, for, for Q&A. Um, so I don't think we can assess the efficacy of what came out of the recent treaties if we don't understand uh, the scale and scope of the biodiversity crisis. And of course, we are in the midst of two existential uh, crises, uh, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. And they have different impacts, uh, different um, species, um, including our own. And um, I'm gonna talk first about what's going on with um, animal species. Of course, I think many people on joining us today have heard that there are around a million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades, and this is more than ever before. Uh, I like to think of these species as a million canaries in our global coal mine, a million species warning us that we are on the wrong path. 
um, what signal are we getting from the planet if we have a planet that cannot support one eighth of its species? And of course, what does that say about its ability to support human life? And this is not just an issue of stopping bad activities, although obviously that's where we need to start. It's also an issue of restoration. More than 500,000 terrestrial species have insufficient habitat for long-term survival without restoration. So we must not just stop, stop the drivers of nature's decline, we must actually work to repair nature if we wanna save these 500,000 dead species walking. Of course, that's an awful situation for wildlife, um, but it's awful, also an awful situation for human survival. Nature's contribution to people is the bedrock of our basic life necessities like food and clean water. As Dr. Bob Watson, former chair of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, otherwise known as IPIS, said, biodiversity and thriving ecosystems are at the heart of our survival, and if we don't halt and reverse the unsustainable use of nature, we risk not only the future we want, but even the lives we currently lead. We have to understand that stable planetary systems have enabled modern human society to develop, and without healthy natural systems, continuing human development is impossible. So of course, people are suffering. Um, we depend on these high functioning, thriving and abundant with wildlife ecosystems produce the critical foundations of human life and society like clean air, clean water, food security, crop pollination and flood control. Land degradation had, has reduced, already reduced crop productivity, crop, crop productivity and we risk more than half a trillion dollars in annual global crops from pollinator loss. More than 500 million people face food insecurity and hundreds of millions of people are at increased risk of floods and hurricanes because of losses of coastal habitat and protections. 40% of the global population lacks access to clean and safe drinking water. While industrial facilities dump 300 to 400 million tons of heavy metals, solvents, toxic sludge and other wastes into the world's waters every year. Altogether, one in five countries are at risk of their ecosystems collapsing because of declines in biodiversity and other natural systems, services. And of course, this is, we, sh it's, we should conflate climate change and the climate crisis with the biodiversity crisis in the sense that we can't solve one without the other. But the things that I've outlined here about the lack of access to clean and safe drinking water, the lack of coastal habitat and protections um, food insecurity, some of that is attributable to climate change, but uh, much of it is not. So, and speaking of climate change, last year around this time, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out a report titled, as you can see, Climate Change 2022, as part of its sixth assessment report. And it stated that many natural systems are near the hard limits of their natural adaptation capacity and additional systems will reach limits with increasing global warming. Ecosystems already reaching or surpassing hard adaptation limits include some warm water coral reefs, some coastal wetlands, some rainforests, and some polar and mountain ecosystems. So part of the confluence of the way in which we solve some of our nature and climate problems by um, building up nature, we have to understand that climate change is also making it harder for natural systems to adapt. And so as they have their other stressors that we will talk about, um, they're reaching the hard limit of their ability to, to adapt going forward. And of course, at the beginning of this year, there was a 60 minutes um, story about the sixth mass extinction um, that we are on the brink of. Um, and I think that the ideas from Professor Paul Ehrlich, who uh, works at Stanford, um, were pretty alarming and admittedly so, um, but uh, it, as he indicated during the interview, or at least one of his colleagues said, but um, he said that he and the vast majority of his colleagues think that we've had it, that the next few decades will be the end of the kind of civilization we're used to. So we can talk then about, well, what, what is, what, why do we have it, so to speak? And I'm not, I'm not firmly in that camp that doesn't feel there's any hope, but I 
do want, I do understand the scale and scope of the challenges before us, and there's no way to, to minimize them. The five, here are the five director of drivers of biodiversity loss with the largest relative global, global impact so far in descending order. And so again, you see that climate change comes in third, um, but over time it will overtake the others. Our economic system has completely destroyed or otherwise seriously degraded vast swaths of the natural world, rendering them unable to provide the ecosystem services we need. I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these drivers and why they happen. Uh, changes in land and sea use. Land use change is the major human influence on habitats and can include conversion of land cover, such as deforestation or mining, um, changes in the management of the ecosystem or agroecosystem through the intensification of agricultural management or forest harvesting or changes in the spatial configuration of the landscape. So fragmentation of habitats. And overall, the majority of this is agriculture. And it is not agricultural to feed the world. It is agriculture in the last uh, several decades um, to produce beef for a very small percentage of the planet. So um, while we do have food security insecurity issues um, throughout the world, and we will have increasing food insecurity issues, um, it's not for lack of having agricultural land, it's for allocating that agricultural land in ways that do not um, work to support um, food for everyone, but actually food for um, the top percentage of humanity with the most wealth. Um, the second leading driver is direct exploitation of organisms. The anthropogenic exploitation of wildlife has occurred throughout human history, of course, um, but that leads to biodiversity loss and extinctions. However, the recent rate of loss has accelerated sharply. The most overexploited species include marine fish, invertebrates, trees, tropical vertebrates who are hunted for bushmeat and species harvested for the medicinal and pet trade. And of course, climate change, um, the direct driver pathways of climate change are related to changes in climate and weather patterns, impacting ecosystems functions and causing the migration of species and entire ecosystems. Um, there are indications that climate change temperature increases may threaten as many as one in six species at the global level. And of course, rising atmospheric CO2 concentrations lead to higher ocean temperatures and ocean acidification, which will have profound effects around, upon marine ecosystems. And we're already seeing, of course, coral reefs suffering, but we're also seeing um, different fish stocks uh, disappearing and or moving into other parts um, of new, new parts of the ocean where they hadn't previously existed. Pollution is an important driver of biodiversity and ecosystem change throughout all biomes, um, with particularly devastating direct effects on freshwater and marine habitats. Um, globally, the atmospheric deposition of nitrogen has been recognized as one of the most important threats to the integrity of global biodiversity. And invasive species come round out um, the last uh, direct driver of biodiversity loss they may be, um, they occur mostly in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, marine and freshwater. They disrupt the ecological functioning of natural systems. And the invasive species outcompete local and indigenous species for natural resources, with, of course, negative implications for biodiversity. And a number of invasive and alien species of weeds have been reported in various parts of the world resulting in loss of biodiversity at local and regional scales and causing significant economic damage. So those are the direct drivers. Um, so the negative trends in nature um, are projected to continue. Um, we see here from the, from WWF who put out um, one of their living planet indexes most recently that shows a, a decline um, in the abundance of species. And the uh, IPIS report, they did a global assessment report that came out in 2000, 2019, in which they said that except in scenarios that include transformative change, the negative trends would continue. And they were very specific about that. They'd actually run through different models about you know, economics as usual, um, slow ramping up. Um, and transformative change. And it was only transformative change that um, gave us a chance of securing the planet for future generations. 
And of course, by transformative change, if they really mean transformative, it's a fundamental system-wide reorganization of technologies, economies, society, changes in the way we think about nature um, and value. Of course, um, transformative change will create opposition from those who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Um, and this is, of course, particularly true in the context of global financial and eco economic systems, global financial and economic systems. Um, and as Dr. Bob Watson indicated, we need to steer away from the current limited paradigm of economic growth. And a recent IPCC and IPBS workshop um, on climate change and biodiversity in which they looked at how we need to solve both issues, to, we, must, we must solve both to, to, to solve one. Um, specifically talked about um, the ideas around degrowth um, as potential options moving forward, including capping resource use and reducing consumption in rich nations. Um, and we, of course, we do have international legal tools to start to compel action in the right direction. Um, there are many different um, international treaties and those um, also that have come out of the United Nations. And we're gonna talk about two today um, both the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species as they had um, recent conferences with the parties. The, and I'm gonna speak about the Convention on Biological Diversity. It was adopted in 1992, entered into force in 1993. It has three main objectives, um, of course, conserving biological diversity, but it also works on sustainable use of biodiversity and share the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. It is the global mechanism for addressing the biodiversity crisis, just like the UNFCCC, the United Nations um, Framework for Combating Climate Change. I probably got that wrong because I don't work on climate change. Um, in the same way that that uh, UN organization works on the climate crisis, the Convention on Biological Diversity is tasked with um, steering the global response to the biodiversity crisis. And I would note that unlike the UNFCCC, where the United States is a party, the United States um, is not a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity. This is the only state other than the Vatican, the Holy See, that is not a party. Um, so what the Convention on Biological Diversity has been doing um, over the last years has been negotiating um, a new global biodiversity framework because the old one expired in, in 2020. These were known as IHE targets. And it, this new global biodiversity framework is supposed to set a path um, for global conservation um, and kind of a roadmap of what conservation needs to happen over the course um, or until 2030. The final text was adopted in December um, in Montreal, con Canada. Um, the framework has four long-term goals for the 2050, for 2050 related to uh, the 2050 vision for biodiversity. Um, and that vision is a world of living in harmony with nature, where by 2050 biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and wisely used, maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and delivering benefits essential for all people. So the framework to kind of move us by 2030 towards those 2050 goals um, set forth 23 action-oriented global targets for urgent action over the decade to 2030. I'm gonna to focus today, we couldn't possibly go through all four goals and 23 targets, um, but I wanna focus on four of them that highlight and can be a barometer for whether or not the parties um, have been embracing uh, or did embrace uh, transformative change and in, in the pathway that they set uh, forward for global conservation. Um, goal A um, deals with the conservation goal, and then we'll also talk about direct exploitation, protected areas, and of course, how we're going to pay for all of this. So the first is goal A. Um, around species and ecosystem conservation. And on the screen, I've actually put the, the exact language of the, of, the, of the global biodiversity framework, what was adopted. What would have been transformative um, would have been um, halting human-induced extinctions immediately. Um, this language is vague. 
here, um, it talks about um, human-induced extinctions of known threatened species is halted. Um, it doesn't really say um, when, but uh, knowing that these are target that, that the targets are are, are towards 2030, um, it could be considered by some if they wanted to um, not move aggressively forward on halting species extinction, which many countries don't want to. Um, they could use this as an as that they don't really have to get everything in order for quite a while. Um, it would have been transformative if they had agreed to reduce extinction risk by specific amounts over time to zero. Um, by 2050 and to increase populations of all native species to healthy levels. Again, this is by 2050, these are 2050 goals. And what we have here um, is talking about maintaining what we currently have by 2050, not actually increasing. And I would note again that uh, when we were looking at the um, conservation um, needs and the restoration needs to save 500,000 species from extinction, the idea of maintaining what we currently have is on its face um, insufficient. So what we got um, was an agreement to halt human-induced extinction with no time frame indicated, um, an agreement to reduce extinction rate and risk tenfold um, by 2050 to increase to increase populations um, to healthy and resilient levels. And there was um, um, in a different target um, there, that some of the language that people had been wanting in Gole was moved to target four, which we're not gonna talk about, um, but it did strengthen some language there. The phrasing of the goal implies an immediate, um, the, oh, sorry, um, tenfold is difficult to baseline and measure. Um, Reducing extinction rate and risk poses challenges for measuring progress. And that's one of the challenges with the goals and targets is um, what is the monitoring framework, which is yet to be decided. Uh, target three is specific to protected areas. And this might've been the one that people heard about um, coming out of the news because they adopted a 30 by 30 target protecting 30% of terrestrial in the modern coastal and marine areas by 2030. That's incredibly important. Um, and that is transformative. Unfortunately, um, there's no qualitative language that we would have wanted to see, such as language around fully and highly protected areas or areas that prohibit environmentally damaging activities. This um, lends itself to the development of paper parks where people can, and countries can assert that something is protected, but actually um, not, um, but the quality of that protection may not be sufficient to secure biodiversity uh, into the future. Um, so what we got instead on that count on the qualitative language was um, this idea of effectively conserved. And uh, if they're mostly, I would assume, lawyers on, on the call, I think that we could all um, imagine the various uh, semi-trucks um, that we could, trains, airplanes that we could drive, fly through effectively conserved. It's language that is very vague and is really left up to parties and doesn't provide the kind of guidance that is necessary to ensure that we're actually doing what's necessary. Um, there was some limited sustainable use language, which was unfortunate because this is talking about protected areas. Um, and those areas uh, <clears throat> need to be protected from all uses. Um, and the idea of sustainability is one again, that is very vague and that a lot of um, people currently claim that their use of resources is, is sustainable. Most of course, fisheries throughout the world will claim that they're sustainable, although we know that 30% of them are overfished. Um, we of course have a need to strengthen the monitoring framework related to the quality of protection and that's what we'll be doing moving forward. And as I noted, sustainable use opens the door for some harmful activities. And then target five gets the direct exploitation. So if we're looking at those drivers again, the top two drivers um, were protected areas, which is the one we just talked about. So there's a commitment to 30 by 30, but the quality isn't that amazing. Target five is around wild species exploitation. And I've again, put the language here. What would have been transformative around this would have been if we had eliminated exploitation that is ecologically unsustainable. And that's a different measurement. Um, you can harvest a species, use a species up to, the edge of up to the edge of sustainability of that species. And in doing so actually degrade um, what's happening in the rest of the ecosystem. And the 
contributions that that species existence makes within the ecosystem. So the whole health of the ecosystem can decline, even if you're saying that you have, that you're actually sustainably using a species. Um, um, it would have been also transformative to, to have to eliminate exploitation, exploitation use and trade that poses a risk of pathogen spillover. And Tanya will talk more about this um, in her section. Um, what we got instead was just to ensure that harvesting is use and trade is sustainable and legal. Um, and of course, ensure is different than um, an affirmative duty to eliminate. Um, we only got the idea of re reducing the risk of pathogen spillover as opposed to um, guaranteeing that uh, the trade in species does not pose a risk of pathogen spillover. Um, the word ensure instead of eliminate is weaker, as I noted, um, and harvest rather than exploitation is not in line with what the scientists talk about when they talk about um, the drivers here, that harvest, use harvest and trade, um, exploitation would have been a better word um, to use. Um, it doesn't really suggest a particular shift in, in values. Um, and of course, there's the finance target. And this is the last one that I'm going to talk about. All of this requires money. We know that there is a around a 700, and the, I mean, this is a mess. You can read it yourself. There's so much in here in part because there's just such a lack of agreement. At one point during the negotiations in Montreal, um, developing countries walked out of the room, literally like got up and walked out given the unseriousness with which the other parties were, were addressing issues. Um, and they really would have closed the funding gap. And the funding gap right now has been estimated to be around $700 billion. Um, what we got instead was an increase of financial resources by 20, and that's $700 billion a year. It's an incredible amount of money. That's the funding gap that needs to be closed, $700 billion a year. What they committed to is by 2030, so seven years from now, we'll get that up to $200 billion, clearly insufficient. And there was also an understanding that we needed to increase revenues from developed countries to developing countries. The, oh, sorry about that. Developing countries had asked um, for $100, $100 billion per year, which is actually quite justified. Um, and the developing countries refused and agreed to 20 billion by 2025, and 30 billion by 2023. Developing countries were very clear that they cannot meet these goals um, that have been the targets and goals of this framework if they don't have sufficient financing. And so as far as they're concerned, this agreement already, in my mind, is dead on arrival um, because there's no financing to back it up. People can make a lot of agreements, but if they don't agree to how they're going to pay for it, it's not going to happen. And so finally, just to wrap things up, um, despite the dire warnings that I laid out in the beginning, um, about the devastating impacts that the crises are having on humanity and wildlife, this um, global biodiversity framework lacks the ambition necessary to address um, the biodiversity crisis. In part, that was because a lot of countries pushed business as usual, um, and they have a vested interest in that, of course. Um, and low ambition countries, frankly, out negotiated others. Um, and they sent some of their best negotiators, Brazil, uh, Russia, for example, sent really good negotiators and they did an excellent job and they just out negotiated other people who, even the European Union, who one would think, um, you know, who sent so you know, many people to that meeting, um, they got out negotiated, they weren't as talented at, at their jobs. Um, I would say that high ambition countries saved the framework from being even worse. Even that quality language of effectively conserved may not have been in there if it hadn't been a push for some of the developing countries like Panama and Nigeria. Um, and that's a silver lining moving forward is that there might be a new alliance um, to provide a foundation for future progress um, from these developing countries. Um, they have the most to lose um, from the biodiversity crisis in the short term. And um, they're ready to move forward um, if the finances, financing is in place. So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Tanya. But my takeaway is um, not the best news coming out of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And I look forward to addressing questions later. Um, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Zach. And hi, everyone. Again, Tanya Sanrub with the Center for Biological Diversity. We'll go ahead and 
get things started on my end. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the about CITES and COP19. But before I get there, I do want to start just a little bit with the convention to make sure everyone sort of knows what we're talking about. Um, so the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species was agreed to back in 1973. Um, so we're actually about to reach the 50 year anniversary of CITES. Um, the agreement was ratified two years later in 1975. There's currently 184 uh, parties to the convention. So that's countries around the, the world that have joined the agreement. Um, and the purpose of the convention is to protect animals and plants. So it's fauna and flora against over exploitation through international trade. Um, for most of us here, we're lawyers. We've probably heard of CITES, but when you talk to people in the public, most people, if they've ever heard of CITES at all, they know it for the ivory ban, right? And so that's the most common thing if you want to sort of try to explain CITES to someone in a nutshell, just reference the ivory ban. Um, the way that CITES works, and I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty details today, but very basically is by listing species on the CITES appendices. And for those of you who work domestically, with the US Endangered Species Act, you will see there's some similarities. And that's because actually the Endangered Species Act and CITES were conceptualized at the same time. And so there's some real commonalities in terms of language and also how, um, how the agreements work, how they got set up. So for CITES, we list species on appendix one, that's the greatest protections. And those are for species threatened with extinction, which are or may be affected by trade. And this is where you get the commercial trade ban, right? So there are exemptions. There's definitely still trade that can happen for scientific purposes. Um, hunting trophies are exempted from the commercial trade ban. But by and large, really the idea is to sort of shut down that commercial demand for species when they are facing the threats that put them on Appendix 1. Appendix 2 species are very much like threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. The idea is we want to conserve them, regulate trade in them before they get to the place where they need a commercial trade ban. So these are species which are not necessarily threatened with extinction now, but they may become so unless trade is regulated. And it also includes species that require regulation because they look like other species in trade. So a good example for that is we have links are listed under CITES. Bobcats, um, when reduced to a pelt, it's very hard to tell the difference between a lynx pelt and a bobcat pelt in the fur trade. And so both of those species get listed under CITES, under appendix two. There's a third appendix. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on that today, but countries can list their own species on appendix three, and that just requires reporting. And so it's a good first step if you are concerned about a species to try to get some trade data, understand what's going on with it. The other key way though that the convention gets implemented is through resolutions. And resolutions are a bit like um, regulations in our domestic scheme. They help interpret the convention. Where they are different though is under international law, they are generally viewed as soft law. They're not necessarily binding, um, but they do help guide the work that happens under the convention. The other thing um, that is used by studies parties are called decisions. And so this is a way of at a meeting of the CITES parties, figuring out work that's going to happen during the next intersessional period. The CITES parties meet every three years, and so work continues throughout that three-year cycle. And that work gets laid out in detailed decisions that are adopted at the conference of the parties or COP meetings. And then the final piece is reporting. So CITES parties have annual reports on, on trade and CITES species, biannual reports on enforcement, um, and then you will have instances where specific reporting requirements get placed on parties or called for in different instances, for example, rhino horn trade. Um, and so those are the key ways that the convention gets implemented. Zach talked a lot about the biodiversity crisis, and I don't want to belabor this too much, but I thought what was really compelling from the 2019 IPIS assessment was the fact that exploitation of wildlife is such a key driver of extinctions. It's second for terrestrial species, it's the first driver for marine species. 
it's really crucial that we address that. And when we talk about exploitation, for us at CITES, we always try, tend to think of, of international trade, and that is absolutely a form of exploitation. But it doesn't just happen when a species or a specimen crosses a border. It's from when that animal was captured in the wild, or it was bred at a farm or a ranch someplace, all the way through the capture, the transit, if it was sold at a market, if it was processed into a product, the whole supply chain is part of how we exploit wildlife. And what's been very interesting since the 2019 um, IPIS assessment is there's been a lot of research into direct exploitation. And it turns out it varies across geographic regions. So where we sit here in the Americas, in Africa, actually exploitation is a key driver um, for species loss, even overshadowing habitat loss at this point in time. So with all of this information, we go into the CITES COP19 meeting in Panama, which was held in November of last year. And the outcomes were good. Um, the parties adopted 46 of the 52 proposals to amend the appendices. So that's how species get protected under CITES. Decisions were taken to regulate trade in over 500 species. And we had crucial decisions adopted to continue work um, for many CITES species. So let me give you some of those details. So first of all, sharks and rays. Um, we saw some huge victories here. And the net result of the protections that were offered to these species under CITES is about 95% of sharks are now regulated under CITES. And so that is really significant in terms of trying to grapple with and get under control the shark fin trade. In addition, um, one of our favorites at the Center for Biological Diversity, we had three sea cucumber species um, that were protected. And a lot of people are not aware of this trade, but it is huge. It's really significant. Sea cucumbers are in demand. Um, for the Bush de la Mar trade. Um, they are used to flavor soups and all sorts of different culinary purposes. Um, they are used for medicinal purposes. There's a lot of demand for sea cucumbers. And while they're small species, they're really critically important for ocean ecosystems um, and something that I think we're gonna be hearing a lot more about in the future. But the real stars of CIDES COP19 were reptiles and amphibians. And so starting with turtles, we had 21 U.S. turtles get CIDES protections and 32 non-native um, outside of the U.S. turtles that receive protections. These are species that are in demand for meat. They're in demand for their parts. And in particular, in the U.S. and the EU, they're in demand for the pet trade. And you can just see from the pictures of these turtles, um, they are gorgeous. And so, of course, there's an element of the population that wants to possess them. Turtles weren't the only reptiles that received protections. Um, there are a significant number of lizards that were also protected, as well as geckos and some skinks. And again, these are all species that CITES is now regulating because of the pet trade. And then we had a huge victory for amphibians, 158 species, give or take, depending on taxonomy, um, of glass frogs were protected under CITES, as well as um, other species, other frog species and the newt. Um, and again, these are species that all require CITES protections because of the pet trade. And then just a few honorable mentions. Um, there's species that got listed because of the aquarium trade and as well as some songbird species. Um, and we can't ignore our, our, our friends, the plants, right? So there were 150 species of trees that also were protected under CITES. I don't wanna um, give you too, uh, <laughs> too rosy of a picture of all of the outcomes. There definitely were some downsides. Um, so there were two big uplisting um, bids that were denied at CITES COP19. And that was um, a proposal to uplist hippos from Appendix 2 to Appendix 1. Um, hippo ivory is in demand as a substitute for elephant ivory. And there's a significant trade in hippo skin for leather products. And then four countries are listed on Appendix 2, have their elephant populations on Appendix 2. And um, there was an effort to try to uplist those elephants to Appendix 1 following um, renewed assessments by the IUCN on their red list of species that 
forest elephants are critically endangered and savanna elephants are endangered. Um, both of those efforts failed. And I think one of the key things um, that also happened that was a downside is while we saw all of these listings of species, which was great, there is a number of those listings that were accompanied by delayed implementation. So sea cucumbers was one example. Traditionally, when um, a decision is made to protect a species under CITES appendices at a conference of the parties, that decision goes into effect 90 days after the meeting finishes. Um, that gives time for parties to take what are called reservations to listings. Um, and also to get everything sort of set up and ready to be able to start regulating those species. That means issuing permits um, for trade in specimens under Appendix 2 and making sure that commercial trade bans are put in effect for, for species under um, Appendix 1. But what we saw at this COP was, for example, sea cucumbers, 18-month um, delay in implementation of the listing. And that can be a really significant problem for species that are in trade because it enables countries to stockpile specimens of those species and then be able to trade them even once the listing goes into effect because they are quote-unquote pre-convention specimens. Um, there's some other good news, though, which is proposals to trade in elephant ivory and a proposal to trade in Rhino horn, both of those efforts were defeated at this meeting, so that was good news. Um, and we had a really interesting decision taken on live elephant trade. Um, so there's a decision to have a range country meeting on this issue. And in the interim, the parties agreed to a moratorium on live trade in elephants outside of their native and historic range. Um, there's some big exceptions here in this language, and I know it's really small on the slide. Um, I'm happy to talk more about it, but yeah, in exceptional circumstances, there is a way to try to go and engage in the CITES intercessional process and still get permission to trade in live elephants. This has been a really big issue. We've seen elephants um, from Zimbabwe being traded to China, to the Middle East. The U.S. obviously has imported elephants from what was formerly the kingdom of Swaziland, now as Swastini. So live trade in elephants has been a really big issue at CITES. And so it'll be really interesting to see um, how the process plays out in this next intercessional period. And then as I noted, obviously decisions are a really crucial way for the CITES parties to continue their work during the intercessional process. And we had a number of decisions, over 50, adopted to continue work for many species that are already protected under CITES. So this is everything from pangolins and rhinos and tigers and lions and seahorses and dealing with ivory stockpiles. So lots of great work. Um, you know, as, as Zach said with, with CBD, um, there's no way we can touch on everything that happened at CITES, but it's still a lot of work that occurred. Um, one of the things, though, that I did want to touch on is CITES really did punt on pandemics. And I think that this committee at the ABA has sort of looked at CITES and talked about solutions and whether it's a good vehicle for doing change. We'll talk a little bit more about this in just a couple minutes. But specifically at COP19, we had a proposal from several West African countries for CITES to adopt a resolution to really hone how the convention responded to pandemics. Early on in the beginning of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, the CITES Secretariat said that their CITES had zero role to play. And I think a lot of parties disagreed with that. Obviously it's it's a wildlife trade agreement and wildlife is, is a key way that novel pathogens spill over. Um, and so we had a proposal from these countries in, in West Africa to really try to have CITES do something. And there's, unfortunately, um, some discomfort with that. And so we have some decisions and this issue will continue to be discussed and addressed at CITES, but we really didn't see the kind of proactive movement that we were hoping to see. And I think what's really interesting is, um, you know, when you talk about West Africa, you're talking about a region of the world where it's likely that HIV spilled over to people, where it's likely where we see outbreaks of Ebola. We're talking about a region of the world that is very familiar with pathogen spillover and is way ahead of most of the rest of the world in addressing it. And so they brought their institutional knowledge to the rest of the world and said, hey, here's a process we could use at CITES to really try to address these issues. And the rest of the world was like, whoa, we're not sure we're quite ready to deal with this. So it'll be interesting to see what happened, but it was really disappointing given the gravity of the pandemic um, 
the significant loss of human life, um, the toll on our economy, all of the effects of this pandemic, um, that we really didn't see that proactive action at CITES. To sort of end on a high note, though, that we did see good momentum um, to address species at risk of extinction. Obviously, phenomenal number of species were protected under CITES, but we also saw the development of a process to try to address more holistically the biodiversity crisis at CITES. There's acknowledged in the scientific literature a real lag between when species are identified on IUCN's red list as being threatened with extinction, potentially being impacted by trade, and when CITES actually takes action. And that lag is years, if not sometimes decades. And so there is a movement now at CITES to try to address that real threat um, and try to get um, CITES to catch up, try to get information to parties so that they understand how significant this threat is um, and, and where listing proposals might be needed in the future. So to sort of summarize on COP19, um, you know, some of the negatives that we saw really were entrenched positions and politics. And what I mean by that is when it came to charismatic megafauna, particularly from Africa, and I talked a little bit about elephants and hippos already, but we saw a southern white rhino downlisting petition from Namibia. It changed and evolved a lot during the meeting, ended up with a downlisting with tons of restrictions so that Namibia can trade live rhinos for in situ conservation purposes, but still shifting rhinos from appendix one to appendix two sends a really dangerous signal. Um, there was an effort to try to really address um, leopard hunting trophy quotas. And while some countries asked to have their quotas removed and that was successful, that discussion really showed sort of these entrenched positions at CITES that are going to be a real barrier to engaging in the kind of transformative change that Zach was saying we need from the scientific literature. Um, and then I already touched on this, but the implementation delays of listings, um, it, that can be a real problem for species, in particular as we grapple with the pet trade at CITES. Um, because the second that a species gets highlighted, it gets listed at CITES, there is a rush to get it into the pet trade. Um, and that can be really detrimental for species with small populations, obviously. In terms of the positives, you know, I talked a lot about the momentum for protecting species and, and parties really taking the, the fact that we have this biodiversity crisis seriously. And that to me was one of the most enlightening things about this, this COP um, for sure. And I think one of the other really exciting things were potential new alliances and the way that things work. At CITES, the EU votes as a block. And so when you're trying to reach consensus, they can speak up, one person can speak up and totally blow apart any effort to reach consensus if they're taking a position that's contrary to a proposal. Likewise, when there's a vote and you need two thirds of the parties to support a proposal, that can be a really significant problem as, as well for proposals passing. Um, this is one of the first COPs where we saw proposals that the EU did not support that still passed. And part of that was because of alliances and support among the Global South, along with support from North America for a number of listings. And so they were over to, we were able to really overcome the sort of EU barrier to getting increased protections at CITES. Now, we've talked a lot about the biodiversity crisis this morning, but we can't talk about the biodiversity crisis without really discussing the era of pandemics, which is a direct symptom of that crisis. Um, as we exploit more species because of an increasing human population, we touch more pristine areas of nature, we increase our risk of novel pathogens spilling over to people. And that risk factor is really significant. Um, and the reason why it's so important that we talk about sort of nature and how um, our relationship with nature results in novel pathogens spill over is because of zoonotic diseases. They make up roughly 60% of all infectious diseases. And that's really where we're gonna see novel pathogens like COVID-19, things that we have absolutely no ability um, to respond to because they're new. And that's where we have the greatest risk. As we saw with COVID-19, you know, it doesn't really matter, matter where a disease emerges in the world anymore. With our global society, it can rapidly reach 
all around the world, maybe not Antarctica, um, although I think COVID has, has landed there now at this point as well. Um, and so it's really crucially important that we address this factor. Um, and this is due to our unhealthy relationship with nature. It's how we exploit animals and natural resources. I think this chart of how our interactions with wildlife, our interactions with domesticated animals and putting domesticated animals in contact with ecosystems that didn't previously have um, human impacts like that are really crucial for addressing pathogen spillover going forward. Um, the experts have said we have a decade to act um, and, and we should expect to see the next pandemic within 10 years. Um, and so we don't have a lot of time. I just have two more comments to leave you with on the pandemic front. The first is when we talk about wildlife trade, we talk about pandemics, most people think about other regions of the world and we don't think about the role of the US in wildlife trade. Um, we take up roughly 20% of the global wildlife market. Um, we import millions of live animals, millions of specimens of wildlife. And again, even if they're dead when they reach our borders, that supply chain is risky and it poses a risk in other countries of people engaging activities that could result in pathogen spillover um, and could end up affecting the entire world. So we need to think about the US role. Um, our organizations, um, Zach's group and mine, we have worked together to try to get the US government to react proactively to how we address this issue by taking a hard look at banning bird and mammal trade um, into the US and really setting the agenda and globally for what the response should be. But obviously, this is also a problem of a global nature and it requires a global response. Um, and as we saw today, you know, the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity really sort of punted when it came to direct exploitation of wildlife. Um, there are provisions in the framework agreement that was adopted on both conserving nature and on restoring nature that are gonna be incredibly beneficial. But again, when we came to CITES, um, that direct exploitation, curtailing those interactions with wildlife that are the most risky, that pose the greatest chances of pathogens spilling over, um, it's really, really significant. And so we're seeing movement slowly at CITES. Um, you know, CBD is sort of locked into their framework. It'll be interesting to see, as Zach alluded to, the, there will be a monitoring framework. And so how those metrics get measured could be really helpful in terms of how we address pandemics. Um, but there's also at work going on at WHO um, on a prevention or on a response treaty that could contain some of these elements of prevention as well. But ultimately, it's really key that we have some work that happens both globally, but also locally among countries around the world. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you all to ask us your questions and so we can have a discussion on some of these issues. Tanya and Zach, thank you so much, uh, both, both of you for your insights and that excellent summary of the conventions. Uh, for those in the audience, please continue to post any questions you have in the Q&A box, but we'll start off with the one that we have. Uh, this is primarily for Zach, but Tanya, please feel free to jump in as well. Given the parties to the Biodiversity Convention have constantly failed to achieve targets, do you think there's any real potential to prevent biodiversity loss through this instrument, or do we need an entirely new approach, and how can the Biodiversity Convention be made more effective? Um. Yeah, I noted in the presentation that the IHE targets uh, that covered to 2010-2020, um, by the Convention on Biological Diversity's own assessment, none of those were fully met. And it actually even led to some parties, um, in particular like the United Kingdom, working to negotiate against ambition because they wanted a framework that, that, that was achievable. And they were like, look, we didn't even, you know, the, in, these aren't their words, but the gist of it was, we didn't even achieve these targets in uh, of the previous 10 years. So let's have manageable targets. That, that is a strategy to move forward, right? Like Because success can build on success. I'm not suggesting that it was all in bad faith, that they um, didn't want to be ambitious, but there could be a strategy behind that of wanting to build on gains. But the problem is we don't have time for those kind of long-term strategies. The challenge around the Convention on Biological Diversity is that unlike CITES, there's no voting. <laughs> 
It is consensus based. And so the lowest, the people who want to really make a stink, you know, at 2 a.m. in the morning, if you're the party that is going to sit, stand there and say, I will not accept this, we are not moving forward, you know, without these changes or with, you know, we can't accept that language. And it puts out and it really does stop things. So I think that the, the hope that comes out of something like the global biodiversity framework is for countries who are wanting to move forward ambitiously um, in regions of the world, um, in particular like West and Central Africa have been have an action plan that's associated with the with curbing the biodiversity crisis. If they use it as a framework to attract international uh, resources to help them put together their biodiversity action plans and actually execute them, then we'll see that kind of progress. Will that be enough globally? No, but um, we're also talking about regional resilience and resilience in particular areas of the world um, that will help them withstand and perhaps set an example for other regions if they see great successes. So we don't have a lot of time to do it, but there is a path forward. Um, I agree with you that the that the CBD is not the best framework for all of the reasons that I noted and, and others, um, but it's the one that we have. And um, I don't see any appetite for something different right now. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, you know, Zach did a great job of really highlighting how our current economic system is maybe ultimately the driver of, of all of these problems, right? And so, an agreement that's designed to protect biodiversity, like the Convention on Biological Diversity, isn't going to dismantle capitalism, um, but it can certainly indicate where that needs to go. But I think one of the crucial things to think about is, okay, so we have a global agreement. It's, you know, view that as setting the floor, right? It's not the ceiling for what the country, what the world has to do over the next, next decade. That sets the floor. And then one of the questions is, as you start to really look at that framework agreement, um, conserving 30 by 30, the restoration target, we didn't talk about that today, but it, it's it's really crucially important. And then you think about preventing pandemics and put all those things together, you're looking at a restoration economy, really. And so you're talking about retooling people who used to capture wildlife um, for their livelihoods, who perhaps should be studying wildlife instead and doing um, tracing and tracking to ensure that novel pathogens aren't spilling over. Um, and to understand what viruses and, and other pathogens are host in different species, and then really looking at how we transform jobs away from the current economic model to really a restoration-based economy. But the question is, how does that happen, right? There's no agreement that the WTO certainly isn't going there, right, either. And so, you know, how do you really make that happen? But I do think some of the things that were agreed to can give us that opportunity to really start thinking about those types of transformations that account for people on the ground, that account for frontline communities and ensure that they still have livelihoods, they're just gonna, going to be very, very different. We only have about two minutes left, so this will be our final question. But for Tanya, what was the reasoning for CITES party's objection to including pandemic and zoonotic disease spillover in CITES? Was it a feeling that it was outside the scope of the convention or did you see some eagerness to address it eventually in CITES uh, or perhaps in the pandemic instrument? Yeah, and I think this is where things got, I think it's a very interesting confluence of issues at CITES on pandemics. Um, obviously, you know, we stress today the biodiversity crisis and the exploitation driver and CITES is one of the best tools that we have to overcome that. And so I think there's real concern um, among CITES parties about trying to saddle CITES also with more global pandemic prevention. I know there was a proposal early on to try to open up the convention and include a fourth appendix that would address um, species that are quote unquote risky in terms of potential pathogen spillover. And I think there was real concern with that because CITES already has a significant mandate that is not being met. That said, if CITES were to fulfill its mandate, if it were actually to protect all the species in need of protection, particularly those that need commercial trade bans, it would do a lot to really draw down disease risk. And CITES parties have a tremendous amount of knowledge in terms of trade supply chains and so forth that could really help the rest of the world. And they need to be a part of the discussions. And I think that was a key part of the West African document is really trying to get CITES wildlife experts to play a part in some of the One Health initiatives that are happening. And Zach, I don't know if you want to add to that. 
All right. With that, I'd like to thank both of our speakers uh, for their time and for their excellent analysis. And thank you all for attending the program. Hope everyone has a nice holiday weekend. And please reach out if you have any additional questions or would like more information. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, Elizabeth and Lavinia. Bye, Tanya. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone.